If Einstein was born in the 1500s, his hair would definitely be slicker and probably parted in the middle. We'd seen him with a puffy chest and a neutral expression, and most importantly, he would wear these funny aristocratic shoes with delicate lace. Now here's a crazy thought. Let's say Beethoven was an adult in the early 2000s. I'm thinking he would look like a member of the Backstreet Boys or NSYNC. Definitely no crazy hair, since he would be rocking a buzz cut. Honestly, I think I love this version of it. Now, if The Scream by Edward Munch was an early Renaissance painting, this is what we would see. A man in a laced-up long sleeve vest with a pouch on his belt to carry water and essentials, of course. Picture an old Bilbo Baggins, if you will. And what if Selena Gomez had been born in the 1920s? Now I'm thinking she'd be pictured wearing a beautiful polka dot dress with a short hairdo and a cloche hat. Would Brad Pitt also be considered one of the most beautiful men alive back in ancient Egypt? I'd say absolutely. These pastel tunics are a great fit for him. Oh, and we saw him in Troy. He sure can sport sandals. Oh, and who's that? Ah, it's Spider-Man, but all the way back in the Victorian era. He still has his red mask, but even superheroes had to be formal. That's why he's wearing a vest with precious-looking gold buttons. And not to mention, this Spider-Man has a cape. Those long tailored capes men used to wear. And that's Doctor Strange. I have to say, he seems to fit perfectly into the Victorian period. He's a little bit fancier here. His cape got an upgrade, and it's embroidered with golden threads and some brooches. Jump to the future. AI generated what celebrities would look like in 40 years from now. So this is Harry Styles. I'd say a mixture of an aged Jim Carrey with Daniel Craig, maybe. And what about Billie Eilish? With natural gray hair, she looks like Tilda Swinton in Narnia. Gorgeous, if you ask me. You know the old sayings. To appreciate life just a tad bit more, you sometimes need to walk a mile in a stranger's shoes. But the people surrounding you have roughly the same likes and struggles, right? What if you could experience human life as it was thousands of years ago, or even a couple hundred years? Why not? Trust me, you'll be amazed at the differences. And the similarities for that matter. Let's start with a time before smartphones, before fast food chains, and before even electricity was a thing. I'm talking about the Stone Age. During these times, our early ancestors were all about living in caves, simple huts, or teepees. They didn't do much apart from hunting and gathering for their food. If you'd lived back then, you might have used basic stone and bone tools. You would have needed those things to hunt all sorts of wild animals, from birds to woolly mammoths. Hey, you'd even cook your meals using controlled fire. Yeah, steaks go way back. But people back then weren't all muscle and no brains. These ancient humans were also the first to leave behind art. They used all sorts of funky materials like minerals and charcoal mixed into water or tree saps to make their engravings. They even carved little figurines from stones, clay, or bones. Now, during those days, humankind also experienced the last ice age, which was a real bummer for a lot of the big mammals that our ancestors used to hunt. Obviously, things started to change. Humans began using smaller, more polished stone tools like spears and arrows. They even started to live near rivers and other bodies of water in nomadic camps. Think glamping, but without the fancy photo filters we use today. Later on, ancient humans switched from hunting and gathering to agriculture and food production. They started domesticating animals and cultivating cereal grains. They used all sorts of fancy new tools like polished hand axes and even began to settle down in the plains. Don't even get me started on the advancements they made in home construction and art. They were weaving, sewing, and making pottery like it was nobody's business. Our next stop in history, Ancient Greece. Want to hear about what your home might have looked like back then? Turns out, ancient Greek houses were built around a courtyard or garden. It doesn't sound much different than what we're used to these days, right? But the walls were made of wood and mud bricks. No fancy concrete or steel for them. As for the windows, they were small and without glass. 
But hey, they had wooden shutters to keep out the hot sun. You probably wouldn't have had much furniture inside. But if you were lucky enough to be on the wealthy side, you might have decorated your walls and floors with colorful tiles and paintings. Unfortunately, when nature called, many homes didn't have a bathroom. So people had to rely on small vessels or even wash in streams they had nearby. I mean, imagine how awkward that must have been. Only the wealthy had the luxury of taking baths at home. At night, ancient Greeks slept on beds stuffed with wool, feathers, or even dry grass. And with no electricity, the only lights came from flickering oil lamps and candles. Wanna talk fashion? Turns out many people walked around barefoot. Some wore leather sandals, or for horse riding, high boots. When it got hot, some rocked wide-brimmed hats to shade their faces from the sun. One thing they definitely did right was jewelry. They sported everything from bracelets to earrings and even necklaces. Now, when it came to eating, men and women usually ate separately, and the rich always ate at home. The less privileged folks would eat in public. But get this, everyone ate with their fingers, so food was cut up in the kitchen first. Fancy being a knight in the Middle Ages next? Back in the day, those fancy pants knights were all about that manor life. But let me tell you, they didn't even own the land proper. Nope, they were granted rights to the income from a manor or other lands by an overlord. And as time went on, these lands were passed down from generation to generation, like a family heirloom. Oh, and forget about dividing that land up between all the heirs. Most lands went straight to the eldest son. Sorry, other siblings. And don't even get me started on the hierarchy. Society was extremely divided back then. Heads of state and the highest ranking nobility were on top, controlling large pieces of land. Lesser nobles had authority over smaller areas of land and fewer people. And at the bottom of the noble club list were the other knights, who didn't even own land and had to serve other nobles. Not fun, right? However, your daily life might not have been that bad. You might have enjoyed some leisure activities too, like playing games, cue the chess matches, and listening to music of the troubadours. These musicians were incredible songwriters, skilled poets, as well as singers and instrumentalists. Let's proceed with the Renaissance. It was a time of change, excitement, and luxury. People were finally able to enjoy some of the finer things in life, like better clothes and nicer tasting foods. And boy, oh boy, did they love the arts. The streets were also filled with craftsmen, artisans, and merchants who had some money to spend. But don't get me wrong, life wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for everyone. The farmers and peasants still had to work hard all day long. Their homes were little more than one-room huts, while the wealthy merchants got to live in giant mansions. Sure, those mansions might have been dark and cold and pretty smelly, but at least they had space. Now, let's get to the good stuff. Fashion! Clothing was a big deal during the Renaissance. The rich would dress up in all sorts of fancy clothing, from tight coats for men to long dresses for women. Entertainment was all the rage during the Renaissance. If you lived back then, you would surely have loved going to festivals, sporting events, and playing games like chess, checkers, and backgammon. But the biggest event of all was Carnival. You would dress up in crazy costumes and had big parties. And of course, there was shopping. You would head to the marketplace in town where the local merchants and craftsmen would sell their goods. Money wasn't as regulated as it is today, and each city had its own currency, with constantly changing values. Now, if you were lucky enough to go to school during the Renaissance, you were probably wealthy. It was the nobles that mostly learned about grammar and arithmetic, but some studied philosophy, Latin, and public speaking, too. There's probably no other time in history more impactful on human life than the Industrial Revolution. What did it really mean, though? Well, picture this. Before this time period, people used to make things with their hands, in their own homes or small workshops. 
But then, someone had a brilliant idea to build big factories and use machines powered by engines to make products in large quantities. The first country to try this new way of doing things was England. But soon, the whole world caught on. The Industrial Revolution started in the cloth industry, where making fabric used to be a slow process. But with inventions like the flying shuttle, things got a lot easier. With all these new machines and factories, people needed a way to get raw materials in and finished products out. That's where transportation came in. The steamboat appeared in 1807. Then, someone came up with the brilliant idea to put a steam engine on top of wheels. And then on top of rails. Ta-da! The railroad was born in 1825. As you can imagine, all these things had a big impact on where people lived and how they worked. You might have needed to leave the countryside and move into bigger towns and cities to find work. But the cities were often dirty and crowded. And while the machines made work easier in some ways, factory work created a lot of problems for the workers. You might not have earned much, and the work was often dangerous. It's 10 p.m. You suddenly feel hungry and go to the fridge, but there's nothing inside. You decide to hop to the nearest supermarket. There, you find the snack you want and pay by card. On the way home, you wonder, was it this easy to get food in the city a century ago? One of the streetlights flickers and goes out. You are now in the dark, feeling scared. Now you know how people felt after sundown in the pre-electricity era. We are so used to power that we forget that it isn't even a century old. In 1925, only half of all U.S. homes had electricity. Without it, nothing would be possible today. The light in your room, the refrigerator, store signs, and credit card. They all need electricity to run. So, how did people live without it? Did our cities lie in complete darkness? Not quite. The history of illuminating our homes and streets is thousands of years old. Recently, 2022, archaeologists discovered the oldest intact oil lamp. They estimated it was 2,300 years old. There is evidence of workshops that produced these lamps on a massive scale. Italian scientists have discovered similar lamps in Modena. This city was the center of oil lamp production in the Roman Empire. The workshops were so widespread that they even had different brands. Fortis, Feitasbai, and Strobili. Some brands were in high demand. So other manufacturers copied their makers' marks. And you thought that fakes were a modern problem. These oil lamps were simple in design. High-end lamps were made from bronze and other metals. But the most common material was clay. People would pour oil through the central hole and then burn a wick inside the nozzle area. The wick was mostly linen. But oil lamps were small in size and were used indoors. There was no way to light a whole street with them. The alternative was You've guessed it. Candles. Humans still use candles today. Your grandma probably has a candle and a box of matches hidden in a drawer somewhere, just in case of a power outage. Humans have been making candles for 5,000 years. When you think of a candle, you think of beeswax. But the range of candle materials is pretty wide. In the Middle Ages, only the rich could afford beeswax candles. The rest of the population had to be happy with tallow. By modern standards, candles have terrible energy efficiency. Do you remember the time when you first saw a candle and tried to touch it? Ouch! You never got that idea again, did you? Candles use a lot of energy to generate heat. That's why they are far from ideal light sources. And the light they emit is not the kind we need. It's infrared. Humans cannot see this sort of light. The numbers are staggering. Only 1% of candlelight is visible to us humans. Modern light bulbs are way more efficient. They shine 80 times brighter than candles. In such dim conditions, our ancestors had to be imaginative. For instance, they covered artwork with a thin layer of gold. This technique was called gold leaf. Artists didn't do this to make their artwork look luxurious. They wanted their paintings to glow in the candlelight. And they had another ally in the struggle against darkness, natural light. Have you ever wondered why old churches have tall, elongated windows? Their main function was to let sunlight inside. After all, these structures were huge. There was no other way to illuminate them. Just take Notre Dame, Paris, France, as an example. 
It covers an area four times as large as a hockey rink. And the building was 211 feet high. That's about half as tall as the Great Pyramid of Giza, so it made sense to build large windows. In homes, mirrors had the same effect as windows. They would reflect natural light around the house. Before electricity, our homes were packed with mirrors. And how many do we have today? One in the bathroom and maybe one in the hallway. That's because we no longer need them to reflect light. All those mirrors have been replaced with a simple flip of a light switch. Today, interior designers advise people to remove mirrors from their bedrooms for better sleep. Talk about a plot twist. But what about buildings that people visited at nighttime, such as theaters and opera houses? The solution was surprisingly low-tech. Candles. Like, thousands of them. Builders mounted them on large chandeliers. But there was a problem. All those candles created heat and would burn for an hour or so, max. Playwrights and composers had to add pauses, so staff would have time to replace the candles. Have you ever shattered a light bulb by accident? Not a pleasant experience, but luckily, you can clean the glass with a broom in seconds. Before electricity, such clumsiness cost people their lives. Knocking over a candle could start a major fire. And there was another danger. Ladies wore long dresses that presented a fire hazard. Our ancestors were literally playing with fire. And this is all indoors. Outside the house, you would have to carry a flaming torch. Or hope that the sky wasn't cloudy, so you could navigate by moonlight. And one smart American decided not to go out at night at all. Benjamin Franklin went to bed at 10 p.m. and got up at 5 a.m. But over in London, going out at night created a new business. Link boys carried torches for Victorians. These youngsters would wait outside inns for patrons to come out after dark and offer their services. And they did their job in times of thick fog as well. That's the English weather for you. Before electricity, it was dangerous to go outside after sundown. But this was about to change in 1807. That's when a German engineer, Frederick Windsor, lit a street in London using gas lamps. It was finally becoming possible to go out at night and feel safe. Now these gas lamps weren't easy to operate. At dusk, a lamplighter had to carry a torch to turn them on, so to say. And then, at dawn, they had to do another round to put out the flames. That sounds like some good cardio. And it was. During their entire career, a lamplighter could easily walk 150,000 miles in total. And then came electricity. In the 1870s, Thomas Edison was the first to produce commercial light bulbs. A city in the west of Romania, Timisoara, became the first place in Europe to have electric streetlights. Half of the homes in Britain had electric power by the end of the 1930s. The age of electricity had begun, but there was still room for improvement. At the time, the most common type of light bulb was incandescent. This means that the light bulb has a filament inside that produces light when heated by electric power. This type of bulb is similar to a candle. It produces heat rather than light, and the ratio will stun you. 95% of the electricity that flows through the light bulb is converted into heat. Yes, you've heard it right. Only 5% of energy is used for creating actual light. Despite this, electric power has changed the way we live. In the year 1800, only 2% of the world's population lived in cities. And there is a good reason for this. Cities were dark places, illuminated only by candles and oil lamps. There was no street lighting. After electricity became a thing, the numbers turned. According to the World Bank, more than half of the world's population, 56%, lives in cities today. And our urban settlements look a lot different than they did just a century and a half ago. They now shine bright on satellite images, from space, Las Vegas is the city that shines the brightest at night. But the story of illumination is far from over. In 2006, Ann Arbor, Michigan, U.S. became the first metropolitan area to use LED for street lighting. It is short for light-emitting diodes. This new type of lighting uses at least 75% less energy than the light bulb perfected by Edison in the 1800s. And they last longer, too. Up to 25 times. It's a snowy winter night. You're inside your cozy house and watching a historical movie that takes place during the Middle Ages. As you take another sip of your hot chocolate, you can't help but wonder how the people survived the winter back then. At that exact moment, 
Your TV screen suddenly turns into a portal and pulls you inside! Oh! You open your eyes to find yourself within the world of the movie you were just watching. A man approaches you and says, Welcome to my medieval village. I am Bartholomew, and I called you here to give you an answer to your question. First of all, let me tell you that conditions became extremely harsh when the cold arrives, and not just for the northern countries. Mainland Europe takes its share of the brutal weather too. So winter is kind of a slowing down time for all of us. You see, we usually associate winter with old age and poverty because of all the changes that occur in nature during this time. For example, we can't really grow any crops when snow covers all our land. And by the early 14th century, things started to get even worse because we started seeing the first signs of what you may know as the Little Ice Age. Cold temperatures peaked. Weather anomalies and extreme events such as sudden floods or hailstorms started to occur, which added to our agony. Take the winter of 1359, for instance. Across central Italy, the snow rose to extraordinary heights. People had to throw the snow into the streets to lighten up their roofs. And because of that, some towns were completely blocked. Their inhabitants were trapped in their homes for several days. Another example of this is the winter of 1389. The snowfall was so great in the Luzerne region of France that many people's farmsteads and houses were destroyed. Bartholomew notices that you start shivering. Ah, you were not prepared for this journey back to medieval winters, I see. Let's walk to my home and find you some warmer clothes. As you can see, I'm already wearing a cloak, a scarf, and mittens, which are all made out of wool. I also have boots that are made out of leather from a deer. Still, all these are not really enough to stay warm when one is outside. That's why we usually layer other clothes underneath them all, to keep the warmth trapped. By the way, the wool can get heavy and itchy sometimes. So beneath our woolen outer clothing, we wear linen undergarments too. The linen acts as a barrier between the wool and the skin, therefore making things a bit more comfortable for us. It is also easier to wash linen clothes, and they dry way faster than woolen ones. The wealthier ones can line their winter clothing with fur. And us regular peasants sometimes use rabbit and lamb for the same purpose. It's not as glamorous, but still effective. We can also hunt some wild animals and birds with the permission of the Lord. Yet again, the sumptuary laws, in other words, consumption laws, are very clear on who can wear what according to their social standing. Take the 1363 English Sumptuary Law, for example. It states that the wives and daughters of craftspeople and land-owning peasants were only allowed to wear lamb, rabbit, cat, and fox furs. You notice a weird-looking hinged metal sphere in Bartholomew's pocket and ask him what that is. Ah, it's a hand warmer, he says as he gives it to you. If we are going to be outdoors for a long time, we bring one of these with us. Otherwise, one's fingers can get numb, you know. Now take a closer look at it, and you'll see that it has tiny holes on its surface. This helps the heat to escape, so that we can warm our hands without burning them once we fill it with hot coal. That's kind of heavy, you say and think about how lucky you are to be living in modern times. With just one click from the comfort of your home, you can order Hot Hands Instant Hand Warmers from Amazon, and no coal is necessary. You can even put those inside your shoes to warm your toes, since they're pocket-sized, unlike this metal orb. You and Bartholomew arrive at his house. You realize that he does not take any of his outer garments off. We keep everything on during the coldest months because the indoor heating isn't always great, he says. 
As you can see, the fireplace stands here at the center of our homes. And right above it, there is a ventilation hole, rather than a chimney, which causes us to lose so much of the heat. Yet again, we don't usually sleep in our outside clothes. Instead, we put bricks and stones in the fire, wrap them in fabric, and take them to our beds to warm the sheets. Wearing our nightcaps all night long also helps. And when we're not sleeping, we usually try to stay close to the fireplace as much as possible. You sure appreciate that hot water bottle of yours more now, right? And you didn't even need to cover it with a cloth, like these folks have to do. It already came with a knit cover for your convenience. And the best part is, it's much softer than a brick, and can be heated in the microwave within seconds. How rude of me! I forgot to offer you something to eat, Bartholomew says. I know I already told you winter means stillness for us, but we still need to put in some work to not starve. There's a lot of preparation to be done in advance to survive these medieval winters. First of all, we start gathering wood for the fire from as early as spring and through the summer. Then there's the food we harvest in the fall. We have to preserve that in a special way, so all will last over the winter months. The same thing goes for meat, too. The methods we use include pickling, drying, and brining. In terms of grains, cereals, and pulses, we dry them out and store them in ceramic or clay pots. We later use them for making potted stews and soups, in addition to vegetables. Basically, everything we can find goes into the pot. The most common foods we eat in our everyday lives include onions, peas, beans, lentils, and herbs such as parsley. We still have to include protein in our diet, though. And we do that by eating cheese, eggs, fatty bacon, or salted pork. In terms of fresh fruits and berries, they are hard to find during wintertime, so we preserve the ones we already picked by the air-drying method, too. You think to yourself, if only these people had a food dryer at home, their lives would be so much easier. They could use it for all the foods Bartholomew just mentioned, from fruits to meat. Then again, there's no electricity here. I wouldn't want you to think winters are so grim, long, and boring after everything I've told you. We still do plenty of activities to keep ourselves entertained, Bartholomew says. But what? It's not like they can binge watch their favorite TV shows. We play in the snow a lot, adults and children all together. You can see plenty of peasants ice skating on the frozen lakes. To be able to do that, we used to use pieces of polished wood or horse shin bones. But now, we have iron skates too. I need to mention though, here in Western Europe, ice skating is not as common as in Scandinavia. That is because they are more accustomed to snow and cold temperatures. Sledding is another fun activity we do. Then there are indoor games, such as chess, backgammon, and other dice games. Wool spinning and telling stories are also common ways to spend some nice time with our family. Not surprisingly, nobles have more opportunities in the entertainment area too. For example, boar hunting is very common amongst the elite. At that moment, a portal appears at the door. Bartholomew says, Guess it's time for you to head back, traveler. Fare thee well.